welcome to the first Insurance Data Lab webinar. Thanks for tuning in. Matt and I launched Insurance Data Lab last month to solve the problem and easily getting hold of comparable data on the performance of insurers, brokers, and MGAs. Our insight platform includes data on underwriting and financial performance, complaints, customer satisfaction, claims, pricing, and MA activity. And we'll be publishing a range of research reports to provide actionable intelligence on the performance of insurance companies. Our first report on customer experience comes out very soon and we'll send a free digital copy to you all when it's ready. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce my co-founder, Matt Scott, who will be chairing today's session. Many of you will know Matt. He's reported on the insurance industry for many years and has authored some of the most well-respected reports in the market, including the annual Insurance Times Top 50 Insurers and Top 50 Brokers reports. Over to you, Matt. Thanks, Dan, and thanks to um, everyone for joining us today. As you'd expect, we're going to be talking a lot about kind of how to deal with customers, um, how their customer experience can help businesses and customers alike, and also look at how the um, kind of the fair value changes are affecting things and what it means for things like trust in the industry and, and that sort of stuff. So if I can just introduce to you our panelists today, Ian Hughes, James Daly, and Vicky Heslop. Um, so we've got Ian Hughes, he's the CEO of um, Consumer Intelligence, the consumer research company that has been working with the industry for the last 20 years. Um, Ian is a real expert in consumer behaviour and recently launched a new um, fair value framework off the back of some extensive research into, um, <clears throat> into kind of how customers are behaving and what they want for what matters most to them. We also have uh, James Daly from um, <clears throat> the Managing Director of Fairer Finance consumer group and financial ratings agency, whose purpose is to rebuild trust in the financial services sector. Uh, James has been a financial journalist and consumer rights campaigner for the past, most best part of the last 20 years now. And he's regularly featured on um, consumer TV shows such as Watchdog and Rip Off Britain. Vicky is the um, head of customer experience for Cavea. She um, first started with the company as a senior claims manager back in 2012. Uh, Vicky is an advocate for uh, better care for vulnerable customers. And she has also overseen the CX team at Cavea as they picked up a gold award for their performance in the customer research Dan was talking about in his introduction. So thanks um, all of you for um, joining us today. And if I can just, uh, oh, just to say before I do get started with the questions, if any of the attendees today um, have any questions they'd like to ask of our panelists, there should be a little Q&A button down at the bottom of your screen. Just type your question in there and we will get to those um, at the kind of the relevant point of the conversation. So feel free to ask any uh, questions away there. So kind of first off, um, I wanted to say that the FCA obviously has introduced a number of measures around fair value, around things like increased reporting and banning price walking. Um, Ian, if I can come to you first on this, what, what do you think these changes mean for insurers and brokers and, and how is it going to change how these providers operate? Oh, I, I think it's uh, it's like a fault line running through the industry and you know, What's been really interesting is almost people have got distracted by JIP and general insurance pricing practices, and they've they've kind of missed the fault line. So JIP is just a tsunami. I mean, it's like huge. It's it's enormous, right? It's, there's no there's no doubting uh, the the importance of that. But fair value is the fault line that sits underneath it, and it's just going to keep on pushing stuff out. So it is a major change for the industry. It's a change of the way the industry thinks. And I think you know it's a it's a governance change. So it's a change to the way that insurers operate, and I think forces. When you look at the consumer duty uh, work that the FCA has also published as well, it, as well, it's saying uh, you know they they want insurers to be customer centric and to be consumer and to think about consumers in all the way they do things. So, and it's not just something that's nice to do or something you put in your business plan. It's what you have to do. Absolutely. And Vicky, obviously working at an insurer, you'll have kind of done a lot of work around this. What, what are you seeing in, in this space in terms of kind of how it's changed, how you operate? I think um, for, for me, it's bringing uh, more to the forefront, which is, is the right thing around putting the customer absolutely at the centre of everything. And that, and that is all customers. Um, but then absolutely that focus on so what, what do customers want? Um, 
we know from all of the research that a lot we've done as Kavayan and a lot of have done that obviously trust is at a real low point. People don't understand what they're buying. There's, there's many, many things you have to do, but I think then it absolutely puts the, the focus and the scrutiny on that. It's doing the right thing. It's making it clear. We have to increase trust. We have to help consumers understand what they're buying. Um, it's got to be more simple. It's got to be more straightforward. And, and all of these things have got the real, the focus on that and that the absolute the right thing. And James, if I can just come to you on that that point as well, what what, what do you think this means for the for the industry? Yeah, I think uh, you know, as Ian says, it is going to be a big change, um, but I think it's going to be something that evolves and grows over the next few years. Now, as a starting point, it feels like you know the FCA has kind of unleashed the concept, um, but but how you interpret that uh, is going to be you know uh, open to discussion. And, you know, I think it's the role of organisations like ours and Ian's to, to help firms interpret that and, and hopefully turn this into something that, that is, you know, really useful and not just another annoying box ticking um, compliance uh, check that firms have to go through. Because I think we, you know, we all agree that consumers um, want and need fair value from insurance and, and that the industry has, has had a bad reputation and, you know, although you know I might often be seen more often by people in the industry out there being a critic actually my sort of reason for getting out of bed in the morning is kind of trying to get to a world where uh, actually people see the value of insurance and uh, you know are happy to buy it because they know it gives them this valuable peace of mind uh, and you know I think the, the beginning of the FCA's sort of debate on what fair value is is it's focused a little bit on the relationship between price and um, and cost. I, I hope it evolves a long way from there. You know, for me, fair value actually is about ensuring that customers really understand what they're buying, are being given every chance to understand what their cover includes, what it doesn't include, uh, and then you know what the cost is from uh, other providers for equivalent products and. You know, I, I don't think we need to get too bogged down in saying, well, this insurer is charging twice what it costs them. So that doesn't um, meet the standard of their, their value, because what underlies insurance is a promise. And some people may put a, an awful lot of stall in one brand's ability to keep their promises. And that could be worth a lot of money to them. Um, so for me, it's not about that. It's about ensuring that consumers understand what they're buying and understand where they could get an equivalent product from somebody else and what the price of that would be. And if you can pass those tests, um, you know, that, then I think you are offering your customers fair value, but, but a lot of work to be done over the next few years to build on the foundations the FCA is now uh, laid. Absolutely, and James, you mentioned there kind of the idea of insurance being a promise. So kind of one of the perennial issues for insurance has been low trust with consumers. And kind of in the analysis we did using kind of data from fairer finance um trust was the across the 24 insurers we ranked was the lowest metric of kind of trust happiness and transparency um <clears throat> what do you think kind of insurers need to do to to turn around this issue they have with trust um and how have they been kind of working on that i suppose over the last kind of few years as well yeah well, we like to talk a lot about the expectation gap you know and that's just simply helping customers understand exactly what the product does, but importantly, what it doesn't do. You know, I think what companies haven't done very well over the last few years is you know, out there in their marketing, they're talking about paying 99% of claims. You know, the messages are all about being there for you when things go wrong. But then the journey and the purchase experience is all about getting the customer over the line and out the door as quickly as possible because the customer doesn't want to be there. Uh, and the insurer doesn't want to lose them and bore them by telling them about all the things they don't cover. Uh, and so, you know, we've created this mismatch between what customers expect from insurance and then sometimes what it actually delivers for them. And so, uh, you know, I think that the key to unlocking real trust is insurers being able to be really clear with customers and say, look, this is what your policy does. This is what it doesn't do. But, you know, even if they're not willing to cover a particular risk, having a conversation with their customer about that risk and saying, we understand this might be something that, that, that you need to um, think about, that here are some other ways to mitigate it, some other insurers who might help you with that, or um, some ideas for self-insurance or ways to mitigate that risk practically, if it's about looking after your home or 
driving safely or whatever it is. And an insurer is kind of building a partnership with consumers um, around you know, risk. Uh, and I think if we can get there, then hopefully you know, consumers will really start to, to value insurance and, and not resent paying for it. And I think you had an interesting idea, James, as well, about how um, insurers use video content to help close that expectation gap. Could you just kind of talk a bit about that? Yeah, I mean, just, I, I, you know, so not videos, not information videos on the site, but just at that moment of truth when you go, right, I'm going to buy this now, because nobody wants to, sh nobody wants to slow the purchase journey down. Obviously, I get it. Uh, I think we probably are going to have to find clever ways to insert more information into the purchase journey. But if you're really worried about that, what about you know a 60 second video at the end when you click buy uh, and you know the customer then it can say look we're just going to play you this video while we're processing your payment details and if the customer gets up and walks off and makes a cup of tea then you know at least the insurer can say i did everything i could to help them understand you know and in those 60 seconds just say look here are the three things that we know our customers misunderstand wear and tear um, you know, just so you know, you need to look after your home and, um, and if you don't, we're not going to be there for you. Some of those core cool concepts. Um, we've, took, we, we've mentioned it to a lot of insurers over the last few years, but we've never seen anyone actually do it yet. Um, so I hope some of those ideas will start to come through because, you know, we, we do need to provide more information to customers. They are, I think, overly confident in terms of what they understand insurance does. And, you know, it's, it's not easy to say, actually, it's a bit more complicated than you perhaps appreciate. And, and Vicky, do you think that um, kind of James' video idea is a, is a practical solution for insurers and kind of what are Conveyor doing at the moment that kind of might be seen as being a bit innovative in this space? I think um, for me, yes, it could be a practical solution. I think maybe obviously from from insurance point of view and then working with our brokers, our partners, our intermediaries as well to think about what are the different mediums, what other mechanisms are there? So videos are used and they're used much more in banking for having a, an easier way um, for, for customers to understand um, be it when the, the, the sign on the line for the mortgages, for example, there's things like that. So I think, but as James has said, it's not commonplace in our industry yet. And I think we need to think about what actually others are doing. And are there other different ways that people learn and people take in that information? And what more can we do? So yeah, we've explored things like videos. We've done things in relation to um, simplifying and um, looking at obviously that there's loads of stats out there in relation to things like reading age. So how can you make things much more simple? How can we use? Um, at the moment, we're looking at you looking at from policy uh, literature perspective, like cartoons or different sort of visuals, different imagery as well as videos. Um, but I think it's going to be quite um sort of not, not not difficult to do but quite complicated to try and really get that understanding across like you've, you've said there because obviously the moment that happens when customers don't really understand or on what they've bought or that it's not covered is when they make a claim and that's too late so how can we do things more upfront um to really help that understanding and that's not just to the insurers it's how as insurers we work with our brokers and our partners to do that as well for me brilliant and um <clears throat> Ian, I know you do a lot of kind of research into kind of the customer buying habits and kind of how they go through the user journey. What, what are your thoughts on this and how kind of insurers can help to improve that understanding? Because insurance is quite complex. Yeah. I mean, there's an assigning, there is, you know, there's this carrot stick, right? So the stick is the FCA comes along and finds you, right? The, the carrot is the extraordinary trust dividend that's out there uh, to be taken. And you know, what we've been looking at, we've been doing, obviously, as you said, we're doing loads of research into what fair value means. And one of the critical things that comes out is the way that companies communicate with customers uh, at the point of purchase, at midterm adjustments, uh, at the point of renewal. And, and it's almost like insurers get scared about those communications and, and how to do that. But actually what you see is when an insurer does that well, they actually get a massive uptick in renewal. They get a massive uptick in a sense of value, whether that's fair or not, from a consumer. So there's an enormous dividend there. And I think I, there's a Jeffrey, uh, Jeffrey Insurance had a video that was a personal video, right? So it wasn't just a generic, here's a video. It was, hey, Ian, you just bought our insurance. Here's some things you need to know about your insurance, Ian, for your whatever the car is, right? So it was, it, was, uh, it was a personalized content, video content created. So 
And that's, we're talking about four or five years ago, technology's moved on massively since then. So it's definitely doable. And I think what insurers need to look at is the, is the trust dividend of leaning into that. And just to give you a sense, we do a lot of work in the banking space. The trust dividend in the banking space uh, just for one company is around six to seven billion when TransferWise goes public next week. Uh, so they've they've basically been you know focusing on fair value within the foreign currency market and built from that and said you know you can trust us um, and and made everything completely transparent but also been great at comms as well and the valuation that's been placed on that business is huge. So I think insurers need to see this as a positive. You know this the. The opportunity is extraordinarily positive and those that get ahead of it the regulation is kind of like you know if you're just waiting to somebody to beat you up then you've missed the entire point that i think james and vicky are talking about here which is this is this is amazing for you it's amazing for your customers and it's compliance it's positive across the board absolutely and we've got um a couple of questions coming in now um from from the attendees um, the first one here um, is saying it's around customer education. So they're saying it used to be kind of the agent or the advisor or the broker's responsibility. Um, but with so much now going through the digital channel, that's obviously changing. Um, how do insurers and kind of brokers ensure that educational effectiveness isn't kind of is, is going to carry on, even though kind of they may be more distracted now, the users kind of going through that, that digital journey? Um, James, if I can come to you on that one. Um, obviously, you were saying kind of about kind of consumers popping up for a cup of tea while that video was playing with kind of so much going on in the digital space. How can I suppose insurers keep that um, attention during the onboarding process? I think that's the, the question that's being asked. I, I think, you know, there's um, there's some work to be done by comparison sites here, uh, which are, you know, obviously a very dominant gateway uh, for people buying digitally. Um, and, you know, they sort of start the whole process off and um, are all about speeding you through and have all, always been advertising about price. Uh, I, I get the feeling they are starting to pivot. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think there are smart things you can do to try and help people understand the different elements of insurance, you know, perhaps gamifying the journey a little bit, um, you know, providing different routes to get quotes so you can have the kind of you know what i can't be bothered and i'll i'll, I'll take the, the cheapest and i'll keep my fingers crossed route or you can have the you know actually i'm willing to invest a little bit more time here answer a few more questions so that you know what i get at the end is a list of results that better meet my needs and you know i think that obviously insurers need to be able to sort of carry on any good work that the comparison sites do there once you know you get to to their end of um of the journey but um you know I, th I think that up until now conversion has been king people have been worried about slowing things down uh, but you know i think that you know the moment has come if you're going to be able to prove that you're offering fair value you're going to have to be able to prove that you helped your customer understand that you gave them every chance to really understand what your product does and doesn't do uh, and all the different elements of it um, so, you know, I th hopefully we'll start to see a sea change there and, you know, we will have to, we'll have to experiment a bit, but, but there are, there are lots of things that I think haven't been tried up till now and, and uh, will, will help insurers. Brilliant. Thanks, James. And, and the second question here on a kind of similar topic, um, saying that, um, see, the, this person sees it as rather ironic how much insurance appears to spend on marketing and kind of getting kind of the policy over the line, the purchase over the line, but he's seeing um, kind of a lack of appetite um, around helping buyers through the process of how insurance actually works. Um, and he's he's asking, is, is that a lack of will from the insurance industry or more of a not, not enough of a push from the buyers to kind of want to understand that that information? And um, Vicky, being kind of um, as an insurer, what, what what's your take on that? What would you say to that question? Um, I, I probably see the answer probably the last bit there is, is maybe a bit of both. I think that, um, I think just as James has described there, there's so much um, focus at the moment. It is about the price and it's about 
getting the purchase in a way um, that's going to change so it's going to be very much more around the quality of the product what's the differentiator the differentiator could be customer experience but I do think from a consumer's point of view and we've done quite a lot of uh, research asking customers about um, insurance about what what about everything from trust through to the decisions they make when they're making purchases and to be honest they also want it to be quite quick and simple so I think that and that's the that is going to be quite difficult. So um, to to help consumers understand more around insurance, but have the more the, the will to, to do that and, and to obviously take, I suppose, take the time and that education. But it's, it's then it's how can you bring it together for me in different mechanisms? So I think, like James has said there, there could be many different digital type routes, be it gamification or doing other things where we can help make it simple. There's going to be some customers who are still going to want to buy over the phone. Um, and then you've got direct, you've got broker based, you've got the aggregate, you know, you, you've got all these other different mechanisms to, to purchase that we also need to think about how do we tackle. But I think it's how for me, it's how do we meet both? So how can we help customers want to understand more about the buying and what the buying um, and then how can insurance company or brokers, et cetera, make it easier and make it more simple? And Ian, I, I saw you nodding along there on my screen. What, what, what do you think on that? So maybe I'm a grumpy old marketer, uh, but I kind of object to the question. Um, so the question says, is rather ironic how insurance spends so much on marketing. So yeah, I get PCW spend a lot on marketing and one or two insurers do marketing, but I don't. So I, I'm an old marketer, right? So I started as a marketer. The definition of marketing is seeing the world through the eyes of your customer and, and, and trying to help a customer better understand what you're trying to do. I don't think insurance spends any money or very little money on doing that. Uh, so in terms of actually doing true marketing, truly helping customers really understand what they're buying uh, and, and simplifying that down and, and, and rather than just, well, as long as I can get a cheap price, I mean, the, the whole industry is being cheapened to getting the lowest possible price and sticking it, uh, uh, you know, to get as high up a, a piece of W as you possibly can. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I just think in the, in the new value world, what we're seeing on the continent, uh, and to some extent you see it with some of the new uh, challenger price comparison sites like Honcho in the UK, where, where they're trying to move the conversation towards a value conversation rather than a pure price conversation. And we see it on the PCWs as well, where you see you know, a brand that stands for something and, and means something can actually pull out of rank one uh, in rank two, rank three, rank four, and sometimes with some brands even lower than that as well. So, you know, it, but I think that's, it, sorry, again, I'm slightly, slightly, slightly worked up because I'm a marketer, but, but the issue here is that that brand has to mean something for you as a business and not just lipstick on something that just is like, okay, well, let's dress this up to make it look pretty, but it's just the same as everybody else. It has to mean, it has to have values. It has to work through your whole business. And what we found when we talk to consumers is where they are working with a company that has authenticity of brand and where they're delivering all the way from the initial experience all the way through renewal and at the point of claims, and I'm hoping claims is gonna come up in a minute as well, I think it is, um, then they love that brand. Not only do they want to renew with that organization, but they wanna buy more stuff from that organization as well. And, and this is where I think marketing actually potentially is just coming into its own uh, within the insurance industry, not at the end. Brilliant. Thanks, Ian. And yeah, you're right. Claims is definitely coming up um, later on in the conversation. And I think we could talk about this for a lot more, but I just want to ask one more question um, before kind of um, we move on to the next section. And that's um, a point on your, the um, point you just raised first, James, around gamification. We've got a question saying, um, kind of, is the FCA on board with that idea or do they kind of still see it as um, too risky, um, I think, to, a move to make? I, I, I mean... You know what the FCA thinks is um, not, not necessarily always easy to understand and interpret. Uh, it's a multi-headed monster um, with lots of different opinions in there. Uh, but I think you know, reading from the sort of narrative over the last few years, I think they are open to seeing different ways of things being done. And you know, they acknowledge the, the problem. They put an enormous amount of work into looking at how well the general insurance market is working over the last. Um, few years and you know they've made some quite radical policy decisions at the end of it and you know I, I think 
the end goal is clear to all of us. We, we want consumers to, um, you know, to pay a fair price, get a product that does what they think it does, um, and, and you know, to have that trust in insurers. So um, I, I don't see why they would be opposed to to that. You know, I think there's quite a lot of nervousness from providers and and the aggregators uh, about overstepping the line between advice and guidance, but. You know, I think we're going to have to be a little bit braver there because, you know, as long as firms can demonstrate that what they're doing is really in the interests of good customer outcomes, I don't think the FCA is going to come down on them like a ton of bricks. You look over in the investment platform sector, you know, we've now got, you know, what's wrongly called robo advice, and it, it is neither robo or advice. <laughs> um, you know, it's it's just the question sets that help you make a slightly more informed decision on your own. And I think we can do more of that in, in the general insurance market. And just one more question kind of from our attendees on the issue of trust here. And that's um, kind of, do, do, do you think that kind of this will open the door for insure techs and kind of tech giants like Amazon um, to come into the industry? Because they already have um, a high level of trust with their customers. Ian, I can see you nodding along there. So I think I'll come to you on that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the reason why Wise.com or TransferWise has a six to eight billion valuation is not because they do a load of stuff in the transfer market. It's because people who use them trust them. Right? And so therefore they're going to sell other things and they've already started talking about selling insurance. Um, so there's absolutely a market here for companies to come in for insure techs to come in and there's a wall of money going into insure tech so there's there's an imagine unlimited source of cash available to anybody that can get this right because the prize is huge if you can get it right but if the price is huge for existing insurers as well and there's mm -hmm. you know if you can get the trust thing right then then you can do amazing things i think i don't i, I i've not seen the research uh, recently but i can imagine if the res your research is anything like our research in terms of trust uh, the only people who are trusted less are the banks. And then, and then apologies, Matt, journalists after that. But, um, <laughs> yeah. but you know, it's, it's, uh, it, there's an enormous opp opportunity here. And, and we've seen massive change through COVID around trust and what it means to be trusted. And, you know, Mr. Amazon comes and delivers, you know, uh, once or twice a week. I'm not sure that Amazon's any more trustworthy, just so you know, as a business model than any of the insurers that are out there. But in the eyes of consumers, see the world through the eyes of a customer, they are trusted, they are connected, and they deliver to me what I want. And I think there's an opportunity there. Brilliant, thanks Ian. And just to, to move the conversation on a bit now and look at um, transparency. So still kind of on a similar topic, I suppose. Um, but it's been, transparency has been another, another issue for the industry over kind of the last few years. And kind of the research we've done on the James's um, data again, has shown a slight increase in this area, but there's still a long way to go. So James, can you talk a bit about kind of what improvements we've already seen in this area and maybe a bit about what's what still needs to be done to improve that transparency? Yeah, well, when we created our customer experience rating seven years ago, um, we, we added in this sort of transparency analysis as part of them. And what that looks at is the clarity of information provided to consumers in the customer journey. So as you say, lots of the things we've already talked about. If you're buying a home insurance policy, you know, is the insurer explaining the different excesses? Um, you know, some of the things that we know consumers don't understand, like wear and tear or matching sets. And um, so we look at all of that stuff. Um, and we also analyze the clarity of the policy documents. Um, we look at the reading ages and um, accessibility and, and some of that kind of stuff. Uh, and, you know, we have seen some firms improving dramatically. There are some firms who have really kind of grasped the nettle and said, yes, we, we want to improve in this area. But as a whole, the industry is just kind of edging in the right direction, you know, and, and I hope that perhaps, um, you know, the debate we're having today, this, the focus on fair value is the catalyst for the much faster change there. Because, you know, all we're looking at essentially in, in our transparency analysis is exactly what I've just been saying all morning. You know, our insurers helping customers understand their products. And, you know, if you're writing your policy documents that, 30,000 words reading age 21, um, well, you know, who's gonna be able to understand it? And, and actually it's self-defeating for you as an insurer because you end up fighting your complaints at the ombudsman and the ombudsman takes one look at your policy document and says, well, yes, it was in there, but consumer couldn't have made head nor tail of it. So pay the claim. 
So I think business interruption has also been a bit of a catalyst for that. So transparency is coming from every angle to the industry now. Uh, you know, I think even more controversially, insurers are going to be forced to publish lots more data around loss ratios, percentage of claims paid. Uh, and, you know, for firms like ours, we want to be able to interpret that and, and you know, turn it into something that is useful for consumers. I don't think anybody has anything to be scared of around transparency. You know, if, if you are the kind of business that Ian talks about, you know, you're a trustworthy business that's doing the right thing by your customers, nothing to be scared of with transparency. You know, actually, you'll find there's counterintuitive reactions to telling the truth, even when it's not necessarily good news, that consumers will go, no, oh, actually, you know, that insurer was good enough to tell me my price was going up. 10% or that they were introducing this new exclusion, you know, at least they were honest about it. So I think we should embrace it. Yeah, thanks. And um, you mentioned um, reading age there being kind of an important factor in this, James. Vicky, I think kind of Kavea did some interesting work on this recently to help with your policy documents. Yeah, um, we've, we've been looking at uh, different mechanisms to, to see how we can um, do exactly what James said there and make them much, much clearer. I think when we when we asked um, customers about what they what, what does trust mean and how that, how that will be improved, I think going back to what they'd asked for, it was absolutely that to make it simple, straightforward, clear, just tell us. Um, and if it goes if it goes wrong, which inevitably things do, you know, everyone's human, then apologise. But then fix it and it's just all those same things are so simple so absolutely and going back to the, the policy side of it we, we've done things from looking at accessibility we've looked at behavioral um, economics where we've looked at how do we reword really you know redesign um use the 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 bits like to talk about the highlights that are needed might be something to say, say it was wear and tear or something it might be difficult and um, make that and um, change it the location of it on the page bold it make it big you know draw people's eyes to it when they're reading it but also an exercise where we um it was called jargon busting with juniors so we we had our people and um, family and um, join us and went through our policy documentation and then absolutely pointed out all of the things that were far too confusing didn't understand and that's everything from you know a contribution an excess um, actually, there's, there's lots of it. And then we've been going through all of that then to think about how do we reword it. And as an example I mentioned earlier was is think about how can we make it more visual. So we've been doing some work recently with, with looking at a, an agency that draws cartoons and think about how can we bring it, other bits of it to life more and bring out the pertinent points. So it's evolving. Um, obviously, we haven't, we haven't uh, there's, there's still lots to do, but I think it's trying new innovative ways to make it much more simple, clear, transparent. Sure, brilliant. And you mentioned there kind of about all the different um, jargon in the industry. Ian, do you think kind of with having so much variety around kind of policy wordings and, you know, definitions around things like no claims discount and excesses, do you think there's a need for some kind of almost industry standard definition that um, to bring that kind of, <clears throat> sorry, that consistency across the, the different policies and the, the different providers that are out there? I absolutely do. I mean, we, we struggle with it even within uh, within our business. Uh, and so, uh, you know, look at, is it NCD or NCB? Is it a bonus or a discount? Um, you know, and you, and you see it across a variety of different areas. So compulsory access, voluntary access. And then uh, the most recent thing is a copay. So what's a copay? Uh, and really trying to get underneath the skin of what that means and, and how it works. There's a real need, I think, to to try and do that. And what's again interesting, just think about this not as a threat, but as an opportunity. There are, there are organizations like uh, Urban Jungle coming out now saying, right, we're gonna give clear, you know, really taking James's uh, uh, advice and, and, and basically saying we give clarity uh, in the way that we do our policies. And I think it, the industry, it's tough enough for the industry because you know, if, you, if you insure for one person and then you insure for two people, you might pay less for your insurance than you would have done just for one person if you're driving. And that, that doesn't make any sense, right? So it makes sense if you're an actuary, but it doesn't make any sense if you're a consumer. I'm going double the insurance for less price. Work that one out. Uh, or alternatively, you know, we had an instance recently where somebody was uh, widowed uh, and the cost of insurance went up. And it's like, that doesn't make any sense. I don't understand. And, you know, really a vulnerable customer at that point in time as well. So I think a real need to try and get some clarity. This is one of these areas, unfortunately, I think the FCA will have to leave that as a space for the industry and maybe the ABI or some others can, can help lead in that area because 
you know, it is an opportunity also to, for, for new organizations to step in and, and give more clarity. Absolutely, brilliant. Thanks, Ian. So moving on kind of the conversation a bit again now. So kind of one of the biggest cha changes over the last 12 months has of course been kind of COVID-19 and how the industry has responded to the pandemic. Vicky, kind of you've been at, at the coalface a bit being at an insurer there. Can you tell us a bit about kind of what Kavea's experience and how it's kind of changed what you have to do? Yeah, I mean, I think certainly, um, I think as everybody's experienced that the, obviously the world has massively changed from um, everybody being as we are now. Um, so at home, you, utilizing different technology, um, having to access different technology to help our people who are at the front line delivering, you know, great service, but they're now on their own. You know, the, you know it, it, that's just totally different. To, um, and obviously what we have massively seen, and I know talking to other insurers as well in different different forums, is just the increase of, of vulnerability in the different situations all our, of our customers are in. Um, and I think I think recent-ish stat from the FCA was around, I think it's 53% of consumers across the UK could now be identified as some form of vulnerability. And that can be anything from, obviously from a health perspective, mental health perspective, financial, um, and that won't change um, and I think what for me what it has done is really heightened the awareness of that um, for, and, and that's for me is a good thing and the, also a bit that I, I wouldn't want to lose to go back and change because it absolutely is at the forefront I think of a lot of our decisions putting the customer at the heart of everything that we're doing thinking about the solutions um, now majority of those people also don't want to actually declare that they are vulnerable so it makes the the focus much more about how do you identify it then how do we help what solutions have we got in place how can we make it better so that that is a massive change i think we've all seen um not that we ever wanted it to happen but for me for somewhat for the better in a way but how do we make sure we don't lose that and, and keep it going forward and and james what have you seen from insurers in terms of how they're approaching dealing with vulnerable customers yeah, again, I mean, it's an issue that's come to the fore, um, you know, particularly because of COVID. Um, and I think there's been a, a whole variety of um, approaches and success in terms of getting to grips with the challenge. Um, you know, I think what, what people increasingly realise now is, you know, we're, we're all vulnerable at some points in our lives. And so trying to create a vulnerable customer's approach uh, and you know, categorize which customers are vulnerable and which customers are not vulnerable doesn't really work. Um, you know, you have to build a system that is flexible enough and agile enough to you know be able to detect vulnerabilities in consumers and act accordingly. Uh, and that's a big departure from you know certainly you know where we were you know ten or twenty years ago. Everybody with kind of call center scripts and um, you know you're having to empower your your colleagues to be able to, uh, you know, use their empathy and, and understand when they need to take a slightly different approach. So, um, you know, I, I think that, you know, that there's a whole range of approaches out there at the moment, but again, you know, a bit like fair value, I feel like we're quite early in terms of, you know, there, there is no right answer yet to this. It's a challenge and, you know, forums like this and, I've been to loads of webinars about vulnerable customers. You know, people sort of learn from each other, and collaborate, and you know, slowly we kind of build a, a system that, that's better at detecting and uh, and supporting those customers with vulnerabilities. Absolutely, and um, Ian, um, I think you have an interesting take on kind of vulnerable customers around kind of the FCA definition and how that ties in with some of your research. Yeah, slightly controversial. So, I mean. Uh, uh, so we put uh, every month, we put the FCA's definition of vulnerable customers in front of at least a thousand consumers. And we've been doing that. We actually went to weekly uh, during COVID. Um, and, you know, you ask people, do you identify as a vulnerable customer? And the FCA's definition, I, I, I was going to bring it with me today, but it's basically you're open to abuse uh, because of some because of a vulnerability that you have. And, and you know, so therefore insurers can take advantage of you. And then they go on to specify, you know, four different categories of, of people that might classify in that. So we've got 10 years worth of data looking at customers. And we, we took an output based approach on it, which was uh, people who've been with their current insurer for four years or more and who didn't bother to shop around for insurance at their last year. And just, you know, what's what's the lead indicators of that? Is it any of those four things or is it something else? And it turns out it's something else. Uh, and and 
So based on, I don't shop around at re renewal and therefore I'm open to abuse, the number one category, category of vulnerability are people who are happy customers and who've had a great claim. People who've had a great claim are really happy with their insurance company and they'd really rather not shop around, please, uh, because I want this insurer uh, to, to work with me. I want to trust them. I want to stay with them. And that makes them potentially open to abuse uh, if, they, if they had uh, excessive premiums pushed through. But happy, happy customers who've had a great claim are potentially your most vulnerable category. That having been said, you then look at the four categories that the FCA is looking at and you go, okay, so, so there's an important diversity and inclusion issue within those categories. And that's, that's very, very important that we look at that and we look at people who are in stressed points in their life. But you know, a lot of the people who've had great claims experiences are, are affluent. So these people weren't people who were at a stress point in their life or any of those kind of things. They were just people who had a great claims experience. So I think there's a real need to get under the skin of what do we really mean by vulnerable. Um, and I think what's been very interesting, just coming back to Vicky's point during the pandemic, just listening to customers and speaking to customers. The, the one thing that you really get out of this is where the insurers, where you're speaking to a, to a representative and they're like, well, sorry, my dog's barking in the background, you know, because I'm a human being and I'm living a real life just like you are. And, and people now are really, ident consumers identify with that. They know that everybody's going through the same thing. And coming back to the humanity of insurance, uh, that's really been a game changer. And I, I'm hoping that we don't just go back into 10,000 seat call centers where, where everybody's uh, just sort of just sitting there dealing with things because actually that's something that consumers really have enjoyed as a result of COVID. But the, the critical issue of vulnerable customers, not necessarily on the four things. Absolutely. Thanks, Ian. And you mentioned there about kind of switching and stuff like that. Have, have you seen any changes with regards to kind of shopping around and switching since the start of the pandemic? Oh, crikey. Uh, like every week. Um, so, <laughs> so there's, I would say there's a correlation between national anxiety and propensity to shop around. <laughs> so the more anxious we are as a country as to whether we're going to be locked down or not locked down. So there was a 40% drop off in people going to get quotes for, for car insurance and home insurance in the first two, three weeks of the, the pandemic, a year and a half ago now. Uh, and you see that pretty much every time there's some kind of lockdown uh, happening. So a big linkage between uh, anxiety and shopping around. And kind of interestingly, over the course of this last few months, what we're seeing is also shopping around has has declined. And what I can't work out yet is if it's causal correlation between um, the, 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 this, is, this is caused by people being uh, the, the anxiety or perhaps the lack of anxiety because they're now able to get out and go and have a drink with their friends rather than shop around for car insurance um, or, or home insurance, or whether that's just because we're beginning to see the effects of the pricing remedy come through and the, you know, the number one thing that causes people to shop around is price shock, is sticker shock, right? So they, they get their renewal notice and they'd see it's gone up a lot and they go, oh, that's ridiculous, I'm gonna shop around. Um, so when the, when the price comes in roughly about the same, people don't shop around. Mm, absolutely, okay, brilliant. And we've got um, a, a few more um, questions coming in here. I'm a bit conscious of time as well. We've got a, a little bit more to talk through. So if I don't get to all of the questions, we can um, put these to the panelists um, afterwards and we'll pop them up on our, our website with some written um, response. But one of the questions here, if I can put this to you, James, is um, this person saying, um, is it really a surprise that most insurers have had a profitable year, given that no one's been driving around but still paying their premiums? And does that represent fair value, um, given the kind of the circumstances we've been operating in? I mean, I, I take a, a, a practical approach to that. I mean, I, I think that, you know, if, if as a consumer your circumstances change in the year, um, you know, that can result in an increase in your premium or reduction in it. And, you know, I think what insurers owed to their customers was the right for them to say, actually, the pandemic's been a game changer for me. Um, I'm not going to be driving at all, you know, and, and then they would expect their premium to go down. Um, and, and a lot, most insurers, I think, did take that kind of practical view. Obviously, Admiral decided to write a £125 million check or whatever it was to its customers, which I actually didn't think was a necessary thing to do. Uh, although, interestingly, um, it, it certainly moved the dial on the customer trust metrics, particularly for its kind of, you know, lower prime brands like Bell, where we just saw, whoosh, uh, everyone was delighted with their £25. Um, but, you know, I think that, um, 
you know, I, I, I don't think that insurers should have had to have automatically give people their money back. Um, of course, you know, when, when something goes against the insurers, they're going to be expected to pay up for it. And I don't think there's anything wrong with some things blowing in their favour one year, you know, as a, on aggregate, I don't think the pandemic has been a gift for the insurance industry, certainly not in, you know, business interruption and the world. Um, so, um, you know, motor insurance has been unprofitable for, for a lot of companies for, for quite a long time. So uh, it's not like they're all making hay from this year, but hopefully that they, they acted honorably with their customers and where they did ask for, a, you know, a, a, a refund due to change in circumstances, they did get something back. Fantastic. Thanks. Thanks, James. So one of, one of the other big um, com- impacts of the pandemic has been around complaints. And um, our research has shown that complaints in the first quarter of the year were up by more than 70% compared to Q1 2020, with unsurprisingly, given the pandemic, travel travel insurance complaints being one of those big ones. Um, and James, I know you kind of do, do research into this as well at Fair Finance. What kind of trends have you been seeing in terms of kind of upheld rates in recent years and kind of what that means for the industry, I suppose. Well, I mean, we're starting to see a bit of a kind of divergence, perhaps between the sectors in the market. Um, You know, I mean, travel insurance was always a bad part of the sector, but it's got worse. Um, I think there are a lot of cases where, you know, we're seeing uphold rates for the big travel insurance firms go up. On aggregate, uphold rates are, are going down. Um, across the industry, which means they are, you know, increasingly getting it right. But what's still a bit disappointing is I think that, um, you know, we're still at about 25% of cases being upheld on aggregate at the Ombudsman, a little bit more than that, and much more than in some sectors, much more than that in travel insurance. Um, And I think a lot of insurers have got to the point where they think 25% is okay. I don't think a one in four uh, overturn rate at the Ombudsman is a good thing and actually that will continue to erode trust you know I think a reasonable target for big companies is 10% uphold rate um, and, and if you get there then you know it's a, a small number of customers who are going through that horrible experience of complaining having their claim rejected escalating it and then finally being vindicated you know imagine how those customers feel about those brands you know they probably spend the rest of their life telling everybody how awful the experience with the insurer was so uh, you know really worth i think focusing on on doing even better still absolutely thanks james and, and vicky could you talk a bit here about kind of how Caveya approaches kind of complaint handling and kind of your relationship with the ombudsman yeah so, so I think from our perspective, the complaints handling is is part of our customer experience program. So it's it's part of it. So that's everything from um, looking at all of the data for all the products and all the complaints, um, doing root cause, um, looking at that very, very regularly. But also that goes hand in hand with the feedback that we also get from things like customer surveys, because actually some of the themes are similar. Um, And we have root cause meetings with everybody from like your operations and your claims areas through to product and looking at um, what's, you know, obviously what's causing it, what the decisions may be coming out, um, how can we fix it, how can we do the fixing right back at, I suppose it, it could be anything from a digital type solution through to product, through to something in, in the call centres, but it's part of the programme, it's not separate. Um, and, and that includes social media, so, social media, so that's the, the, our social media is now um, handled with our customer relations team as well, so you can get right to the, the crux of the problem and, and fix it or respond as quickly as you can. Um, And I think the the other thing we do very much is look at upheld rates, look at decisions. Um, We meet with the Ombudsman regularly. So that's part of our program with our account manager to look at individual cases through to trends. Um, And and some of the trends we've seen this past year, things like we've already talked about increase of vulnerability, but actually work through them and look at each obviously each complaint or each consumer, some some circumstances will be quite unique, some might be quite similar, but um, what what's the best customer outcome? And and then learning from it, and I totally agree with James there about looking at upheld rates, because um, that is the worst thing from it, like you said, from a customer's perspective, that they've had to make a complaint and then it, it's upheld. And, and like you say, that just, I agree, they will be probably talking about that forever. Uh, and hold that against that company so it's 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 got to be so integral to everything you do absolutely and um our research shown that kind of 
the majority of these ombudsman complaints um, relate to the claims experience itself. And um, it's actually been increasing kind of over the last few years as well. Ian, I know you mentioned kind of claims earlier in one of your points. What, what do you think on that? And what can the industry do to, I suppose, help offer a better claims experience for its customers? So claims is where the rubber hits the road, right? So it's it's where the where the promise becomes a reality, and it's super important that the industry gets that right. It's 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 the thing that drives fair value, and by the way, the thing that will also, if you get it right, drive renewal. So come back to my point about vulnerable customers earlier on. Get that right, then you'll keep a customer that much longer. Um, and I think it's it's so there was I remember being asked a question recently about oh well why hasn't the why hasn't the FCA regulated the claims space in terms of the quality of claims delivery and I think they have they've said you've got to give fair value to customers and fair value is around claims and what you do in the claims process that is the moment of truth right whether it be a home claim or a motor claim these are the places or even a travel claim right so the hence the reason for the complaints uh, around the the travel claims are going up and up and up because this is the thing that drives a real experience for a customer so i think claims uh, has gone from being something that's kind of like a cost base and we try and mitigate that cost as much as we possibly can to being almost on the front line of fair value and i'm really kind of excited to see how that that really enables and empowers a business uh, to, to drive claims. It's not about whether you paid 99% of claims, it's about whether the people who experienced those claims felt that they, you know, they got the value that they wanted from the insurance that they bought. And sometimes, uh, and we have, we were just talking about this uh, yesterday, sometimes that might not be that you pay a lot of money out, right? We, we so recently, we were looking at somebody on temporary replacement car, they'd be given a temporary replacement car for a week uh, and they, they scored the claims experience as a, as a one out of 10. And when asked the question, why was it a one out of 10? It was because the car they were given was too big for them. They didn't know how to drive it. They were scared of driving it. And then when asked the question, well, what do you do with a car? The answer is, I just use the car to go to the shops once a week. And that's all they wanted the car for. So just get them a taxi. Uh, you know, so think, don't think about it as a car and we need to replace the car. Think about the person and what they're doing, and then you'll get fair value, which is what this conversation is about, but you'll also get a really happy customer. Absolutely. And James, I can see you nodding along there as well. Um, what are your thoughts on what Ian was saying? Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with that. Um, and, you know, I, I think, you know, claims, as Ian said, is, is the only thing that matters, really. It's just, you know, do insurers keep their promise? Um, uh, and you know something that's that's hard for us to really get get at. Actually, I'd like to be able to see better behind the scenes. You know, unfortunately, I'm not able to become a customer of every insurer out there. I'd really love to be able to assess that better. Um, and, and so I hope that some of the stuff that starts to be published will give us a little bit more of a lens of what's going on there. But you can't overestimate how important that that moment of truth is. And um, you know, if you deliver it well. Uh, then, you know, as Ian said, you'll keep that customer for a very long time. And that is a lot cheaper than going out and acquiring new customers. Um, and, and they'll advocate for you as well. So the difference between a customer that's gone through that complaints process, had an uphold at the Ombudsman and spends the rest of their life telling everybody how awful you are versus, you know, someone who has an amazing experience at claim stage and spends the rest of their life telling everybody they know how great that insurer is, um, you know, it makes an enormous difference. Absolutely. And we're actually coming to the end of our time now. So if I could just kind of go around and just get a few closing kind of remarks from you, Vicky, um, if I can just come to you first, just to get your take, I suppose, on where you think customer experience is and where it's going. Um, I, I think I just wanted to add a little bit to what James was just saying there. I think from, from our perspective and mine, certainly our customer experience program actually started with claims. Um, not all of it, obviously, but a significant amount. And it was absolutely about putting yourself in the customer's shoes and really thinking about the situation they are in as an individual. If you were in that situation and how can you 
to solve it and think out the box because actually that those cases that really need something are few and far, far between but our you know the, I suppose it's that empowerment and that really thinking about it from a frontline perspective about doing something that's different if needs be and I, I've got those examples and I still keep them where I've had customers that have sent in to us thank yous bunches of flowers gifts for staff because we didn't just do system says no um you know you're not covered for a courtesy car because it was da, da, da. we've given them a vehicle because so they could still take their holiday that weekend when they were taking one of the you know the children to alton towers or something and that stays with that that's thinking out the box but it's putting yourself in those shoes and doing something that is so worthwhile and memorable and that is what's really really making a difference and that does stay with the customer just like James example was there and I'd like to think that I know there's all the things we've talked about today in relation to fair value but that's absolutely what will make you stand out to that customer um, and it doesn't happen on every claim and it's not needed to but if you do have that um, sort of uh, that culture um, of doing the right thing it will, it will pay dividends. And, and, and we see this every day in all of our different product lines as well, absolutely putting yourself in the customer's shoes and doing the right thing. Absolutely brilliant. Thanks. And Ian, if I can come to you just for some closing thoughts. Yeah, so Vicky just used the word culture, right? So that's right at the heart what the FCA is saying. This isn't about them rules. This is about how you run your business and your culture. And if you put customers at the heart of your business and you, you focus on customers, then you will get the regulatory outcomes that you need. You'll make the regulator happy. But, and here's the really exciting piece, you will also get the commercial outcomes you're looking for as well. But if you start by looking at the commercial outcomes, you're gonna have problems with the regulator and problems with your customers. So start and end with fair value for customers and look forward to the returns from a commercial perspective and having a happy regulator. Fantastic, thanks Ian. And James, last but not least. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, as we've said, Let's use this uh, issue of fair value and this challenge as an opportunity to really move the industry forward. You know, if you're from an insurer here today, you know, think about this uh, uh, as a chance to, you know, really take a fresh look at everything you're doing, um, you know, and uh, use consumer intelligence or fairer finance to help you do it. I do think insurers should look outside their own firms, you know, get, get somebody to come in and help them with that you know let's not just see this as another box ticking compliance exercise let's let's use this as a moment to really move the industry on and to rebuild trust with consumers fantastic thanks for that james well um it's just gone midday now so we'll um, have to call it an end there but i hope you've all found it um a useful and interesting conversation and yeah thanks to all our panelists uh, ian james and vicky and um, we've had some really great conversations today so thanks very much for that